It's a story of the Indian Air Force which has perhaps not been told enough. It's the story of a real hero. A man who in 1965 engaged not one but four Pakistani sabre fighters. He's back in India now. He lives in Australia. But Flight Lieutenant Alfred Cook is a legend for what he did. And that dogfight which he flew over the skies of Kalaikunda goes down as one of the greatest dogfights in the Indian subcontinent. I'm very, very privileged to have the opportunity of interviewing him. Thank you so much uh, for speaking to us. Thank you, Vishnu. Let's get straight into the thick of action. You were flying at treetop height when you shot down your first saber over Kalaikunda, near Kalaikunda. Tell us about that. Well, that was just south of the airfield and uh, they were flying very low to avoid, to avoid me. They would dive down when their speed would, uh, would drop off to the, towards the ground and build up speed and then turn again. So I was having to follow him. The idea being that with me following him, I may mush into the ground, which almost happened. But I was very low and when I saw him that time, I had my gun sight on him and I just pressed on with the attack. Right. Not knowing that my wingtip was hitting the scrub at that stage. So your, your wingtip was, was actually, you'd actually hit the ground at that stage? Not the ground, I was hitting the, the, scrub, the, I was hitting the scrub, the small bushes which would have been about four or five feet high. And so high. you were flying at what speed? My speed? In a dogfight just over the ground? My I mean speed, approximately. My speed would have been about 400 knots. Right. So 400 knots, just a few feet over the ground in a dogfight. Yes. Perhaps the lowest dogfight that anybody would have heard of in the jet era. Um, and then you targeted him and you shot him down. Yes. And uh, what happened immediately? Were you able to, to, to escape um, the, the debris in front of you? No, I was so close that when I hit him and stopped firing, his aircraft exploded and I could not avoid flying through the fireball. And uh, I felt that, um, not exactly the impact, but the heat made my aircraft sort of like you, when you hit a, a little air pocket and I was of course just about 50 feet off the ground at that stage and I could not sort of savor that moment because I knew somebody else was after me so I had to turn up turn hard right pull up and engage the other aircraft and okay. then so this was the so basically just for the context of our viewers these were four Pakistani planes uh, sabers which were attacking the Kalaikunda airfield. Three of them were in a, in a, uh, in a diving position and they were trying to, to, to hit targets on the ground. This was the second raid of the day. An earlier raid during the day had been very successful. They had uh, destroyed two Indian Canberras and four Vampire aircraft as well. It was during the second raid that uh, then Flight Lieutenant uh, Cook actually was engaged into the air defense around that area and along with him was uh, his wingman at that stage. So you've told us about the first uh, encounter as it were, then you pulled up and then you engaged the second aircraft. What happened there? Well, it was fairly relentless. Uh, they were able to uh, turn inside me, you know, out turn me, so... The Sabre being more maneuverable than the Hunter. Being more, more maneuverable and having a tighter turning circle. So I would tend to to sort of flash out and he would reverse so I would tend to get in front of him so I would make use of my extra power and speed to pull away and get away from his line of fire and I can see him holding his nose up there and firing but I was out of his line of fire and in doing that he would lose his speed and he'd have to dive down again to build up his flying speed and I would follow him and this carried on for quite a while how did you get behind him finally? Well, every time he dived on, I'd get behind him and he'd pull out the dive and turn away and I would, uh, we would do what we call a classic scissors uh, maneuver. And you kept firing at him? No, I only fired when I was in the firing position. Right, and when you did that, you actually saw bits of, uh, of his aircraft fly off? Yeah, there are pieces flying off because uh, when, I, when I finally got behind him, because in the maneuvering that we did initially, we were crossing so close to each other, we could see each other's faces. And, uh, you actually saw the face of the... I could see the face of him and he could see my face. And I could see his helmet, white helmet, with, which I now have found that had his name on it. And I had a white helmet with my name on it as well. But when he actually uh, 
did that final maneuver. He was slightly behind me, so I pulled up very steep and made use of the 10,000 pounds thrust that I had on my Hunter with the Rolls-Royce Avon engine. And he couldn't get there, and he mushed past me and went to the thing, and he was very close. And I followed him into this particular dive, and I was in a good position. I, so I started firing once I got my gun sight on him. And I knew I was hitting him, but I was expecting him to explode because we normally carry high explosive ammunition. But at this stage, I was out of the high explosive ammunition and into the practice ball ammunition. Hmm. And he was diving away from me. And then I suddenly noticed that he increased the angle of dive and the bank away from me. And I said, uh-uh, somebody has warned him, so that person has to be behind me. So this was now a third aircraft? Third aircraft. That was so I kept on firing at this guy and expecting him to, to explode, but nothing happened. Then he started pulling out. I could see pieces flying off him. And I said, if I don't stop uh, firing, because the hunter has a much faster rate of acceleration, I would have collided with him. So mm. about 80 yards or so, I broke away. Mm. And I pulled up once again, and this other guy was coming at me. So within a couple of reversals, I was on his tail. And then you engaged in this incredible situation where you were both diving. Yes. And this was with the third aircraft. With the third aircraft. And there's some incredible uh, footage which we actually have of the actual encounter uh, from your gun camera. So you were in a steep dive behind the Sabre, yep. uh, but you were running short of ammunition no, at that I stage. No, I was running short, not at that stage. Uh, he pulled up into a high wing over mm -hmm. and I was uh, behind him, so I had a shot and there's clouds in the background you'd see. Then he went into a vertical dive to get away from me and he was going one way and I was going the other way and I was vertically going down like that, firing at him. And I was wondering why he's not hitting him. Why is he not exploding? And his aircraft pulled away and I was still worried about why he hadn't been hit. So then suddenly I realized that the ground was coming up pretty fast. And with my finger still on the trigger, I pulled back on the, on the joystick and unfortunately, I expended whatever ammunition I had left oh, right. because on the Hunter we only have about five seconds firing time mm. and you're firing at a hundred rounds per second mm. so I expended my ammunition while pulling out of the dive and I almost hit the ground and I was very very shaken at that stage mm. so I got my bearings back got my equilibrium back and I was about a kilometer south of the airfield at the stage so I turned around and towards the airfield and that is when I saw a Sabre behind my number two. Yes. And you warned him at that stage, yes. your number two. My number two was flying at about 1,500 feet. Mom gain, feet, right? Mom gain. Yeah. And judging by the speed, he would have been about 300, 350 knots. And the Sabre was about 1,500 uh, yards away from him, closing in. So I gave Mom gain a warning. I said, Mom, brake port. Brake port means to do a hard uh, evasive turn to the left. And... Uh, he said, what's that? I said, brake port. <laughs> so he did that. And then I engaged this guy. And this was right over the airfield, right over the flying control. He started doing loops and aerobatics to try and shake me off. And at this stage, my aircraft was light. And aerobatics and things are what we do for fun. So I was had no problem staying behind you it. You had no ammunition in any case, so you couldn't shoot him down. No, I couldn't shoot him down. But I got into a position, and I, while, I, while I was getting into a position by him doing all this, I was fiddling with my gun selector switch, hoping that I'd have at least one or maybe two bullets left. Uh -huh. So I fiddled with the switches, got it back, and said, got into a position, had a shot, but only the camera worked. Right. So I was closed in even further. There's, on the right-hand side of the back, we have a little circuit breaker I checked to see if that was in mm -hmm. so I put my head down there checked that was in mm -hmm. closed it again had another shot and again only the camera worked right so that and, and you essentially chased him out of, of that that uh, yes mm -hmm. after he uh, he's when he obviously realized that it's his lucky day it was very much his lucky day but just tell me um, you definitely shot down uh, one uh, saber but you believe you've sh you in, in the second engagement, you probably had the second, uh, the, the second Sabre as well. That's right. And pieces were flying off the aircraft. So. And no one really knows what happened to that aircraft. No idea. But uh, the enemy are, are supposed to have given me credit for that one. I don't know. All right. 
Well, sir, um, you are uh, an absolute hero. And uh, what happened 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago now, uh, on that day, um, redefined, in a sense, uh, air combat, certainly over our skies. It's been a great privilege speaking to you. Of course, live in Australia now. Uh, but I'm sure it was fantastic for you to come back to your old squadron uh, in Ambala. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.